Close your eyes. I think it would be great if we just, first of all, begin our morning this morning by putting our focus on the Lord right now and just by worshiping Him. And I want you to offer up like the priest did in the Old Testament. They offered up a morning sacrifice, like a just a, a sweet-smelling aroma. I want you to do that. Your worship is that to God. So just, just everybody, close your eyes and just begin to tell the Lord how much you love Him. Just praise Him. Worship the Lord in your own way, in your heart. God, we glorify you today. We love you, Lord. We put our focus first and foremost upon you today. This gathering, uh, we believe, is supposed to be a supernatural gathering of people who understand you and understand your word and understand your ways. God, today I pray that indeed it would be supernatural with your presence. We love you, Lord. We honor you. you your word says in Psalm 22 that you abide in the praises of your people. And so today, Lord, we worship you. We honor you. We magnify you, God. We again in our minds put you in that rightful place on the throne of heaven, the king of the earth. Lord, nothing happens on this earth that doesn't escape your notice. Uh, all Anywhere in the world, if a bird at this very moment falls from flight, you see it, you know it. God, you know our troubles, you know the nations of the earth, you know the conflicts, the wars, you know what's going on behind closed doors. And you're our Father. God, we trust you that you are intimately involved in our lives. And today, God, we just magnify you. We glorify you. We love you, Lord. We magnify you today. I pray that this will be a house of prayer. I pray that this will be a house of worship and of praise. Somewhere where you are invited, somewhere where you feel welcome not a strange place, not a place that is difficult for you to flow here, Lord, among us, but Lord, make it an easy place, a place of joy and happiness of peace. I pray for those who sorrow that it would be lifted from them today. I pray for those who suffer with depression, it would be lifted from them today. I pray for those who have physical problems, they would be healed today. I pray for those who have problems forgiving themselves that they would be able to accept, receive, and bask in your forgiveness. Lord, I pray for those who have a problem forgiving others that they would learn to forgive and release. God, I pray for those who come in full of worry and fear for their financial situations, their health, for their children, that you would alleviate them from worry. God, I pray that you would set people free today. If you have any kind of addiction, any kind of problem, anything, anything, I want you to ask the Lord, Just, and I'm going to ask you to do this, to raise your hand, at least one hand, if not both hands to Him, and ask the Lord to deliver you and free you from every bondage and addiction that holds you captive. God's not mad at you. He's not angry with you. Don't be embarrassed. Just call upon the name of the Lord and say, God, help me. I've got an attitude problem. I've got a, I've got a drug addiction. I've got addictions to painkillers to alcohol I've got an addiction to pornography whatever your case may be don't be embarrassed by it just release that to the Lord and say God deliver me in Jesus name now everybody just clap your hands and welcome God here today come on clap your hands and make, make it worthy of a king We bless you, Lord. Hallelujah. Now look up to the screen. Let's say it together. All right, say it like you mean it. Ready? I am blessed. I'm blessed going in and blessed going out. <laughs> How about that? You know it by heart. Praise God. <laughs> well, I, you know what? I feel like your I feel like, you know, the, the meter of your clap is probably at about 60%, you know, and I'm 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 waiting for that other 40% to kick in. I want you to kick it in and act like you got some joy in your heart today. Come on. There you go. 
Come on, everybody. Act like you got something to live for today. Act like you've got something to be happy about today. Now be sure and look in a 360-degree circle and welcome everyone that's around you here today. Look at the person beside you, behind you, in front of you. Just say, welcome to Open Door. I'm glad you're here today. Shake their hand. Give them a high five. If you're watching online, I want to welcome you to Open Door today. Thank you for being a part of this service today. It is no accident that you're watching, whether you're watching live or one of our archived events. We believe that God has a message for you and He's going to talk to you and He's going to bless your life. If you want to get some questions answered or post on our Facebook page, you can go to Open Door Ohio on Facebook. Do that. You can do it right now. And uh, leave us a message, leave us a comment. We would love to hear from you. Thank you. You'll have to help me here. This end. There it is. Did you do that or did I do that? You did it? We'll start a new series today. <clears throat> if you look up to the screen, it's called 12 Elements of Faith. And uh, we're going to start this, and we're going to just spend a few weeks. Obviously, there's going to be 12 weeks in this teaching. And this was actually something that I felt like God was downloading on me during vacation. We went on vacation a couple of weeks ago, which is always a great time. And uh, it, it kind of clears the mind. So we were up in the mountains of Tennessee, in the Smoky Mountains, and in the morning... We had a nice balcony view, and I would go out on the balcony, and in the morning we had a good time just to, just to sit there and have those devotions and enjoy myself. And uh, it was during that time that the Lord began to download uh, for me, thank you, began to download about what it means to have faith, and that there's, many, there's more than one dimension of faith, more than one thing that faith, uh, that faith is. And so if you look up to the screen, you'll see somewhere... On that, uh, on that graphic, what it means to have faith. And uh, today we're going to talk about the first element of faith. By the way, when you come in today, you notice at the registration tables that we have notes for you. We have notes normally every Sunday for you. Today's the first Sunday of the month, so we have name tag Sunday. And uh, one Sunday of the month, we all wear name tags. And that just is so you can see people and know their first name. And uh, maybe you don't know them well enough to know their name, but maybe you feel like you should. Today, you can call them by their first name because they've got name tags on. So it's a way just to really get to know one another. As our church grows, people come in, then you have an opportunity uh, to get acquainted with them. All right? So uh, watch me, Nick. You're going to have to help me uh, scroll this forward. So let's move forward with it, please. Today we're going to talk about the first element of faith, which is vision. Now, if you have your notes, uh, the scripture is on the notes. If you have your Bible, go to uh, Acts chapter 2, verse 17. Now, let me explain this situation. The apostle Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was the day when God's Holy Spirit was poured out on the earth. And so these guys got real excited. We don't know what they were doing, but we do know from the context that there were people there in Jerusalem who were accusing them of being drunk. Because one of the first words that Peter said when he started preaching is, these men are not drunk as you suppose. And so when the Holy Spirit came down upon these people, there was uh, an unusual things that were going on. In the process of preaching, Peter quotes a remote scripture from a prophet named Joel. Now, the Old Testament is a big book, and the book of Joel is sandwiched in there in an area called the Minor Prophets because the, these prophets wrote these little small books and they were included in the Bible. And one of those Minor Prophets was a guy by the name of Joel. And Joel prophesied that certain things would happen in the last days. And Peter, while he was preaching, pulled from this passage and applied what Joel was prophesying about to that present situation. I want you to read it if you have your notes, if you have your Bibles. It's Acts chapter 2, verse 17. In the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit on every kind of people. Now this is coming out of the Message Bible, actually. Your sons will prophesy, also your daughters. Your young men will see visions. Everybody say, see visions. And then he says, your old men will do what? Dream dreams. Young men see visions, old men dream dreams. 
why do old men dream dreams? Because they sleep more. I'm still seeing visions. I don't know about you. When the time comes, I'll pour out my spirit on those who will serve me, men and women both, and they'll prophesy. <clears throat> so what God is saying here is that when the Holy Spirit comes, there's just certain things that begin to happen supernaturally in the heart of men and women. I'll set wonders in the sky above, signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billowing smoke, the sun turning black, <clears throat> excuse me, the moon blood red before the day of the Lord arrives, the day tremendous and marvelous and whoever calls out for help to me God I uh, will that person will be saved okay and so the one the part that I wanted you to underline there is the part about dreaming dreams and seeing visions the first element of faith is this you have got to develop the ability to see a vision in other words you have got to see what you want to become and you've got to see yourself in that place too many people do not have a vision for their life they don't have a vision for themselves if you want to be a champion you've got to see yourself as that champion if you want to be a successful business person you've got to see yourself being that successful business person. Now the beautiful thing about it is this, that God has given every human being, every human being has the ability to see vision. Every one of us. In fact, the way the human brain is wired is that you are wired to see things in pictures. Let me, let me, let me illustrate this. If I would mention to you your first grade teacher how many people can see the teacher, see the classroom, and see the desk that you sit at in first grade? Right. Probably nobody saw the word teacher. Or in my case, it was Mrs. Parsons over at Huntington School. I, yeah, we, we went to the same school. I did not see the name Mrs. Parsons. I didn't see the letters. I didn't see the name. But you know what? I saw her. I saw the room. How about if somebody says this, Grandma's house? How many people saw Grandma's house? You didn't see the word grandma, you didn't see her name or her social security number, you saw grandma. The fact is, your brain does not record words, it records pictures. And even if you can see a word or see a name, it's because you've seen it on a page and your brain actually has brought a picture up, like a photograph of a word, your brain has brought that word up before you. Now, why did God outfit our brains to see things in pictures? Why? Because God gave human beings this particular ability not only to draw pictures from your past, but you have the ability to draw pictures for your future. And believe it or not, your life today is a reflection of the pictures that you did or did not draw of yourself one year ago, five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago, today. You say, now wait a minute, I never saw myself in this position. You ever think that maybe you're in this position because you never saw yourself in any other position? Having no vision for your life is just as bad as having a bad vision for your life. So you have three choices. You can have a good vision for your future, a bad vision for your future, or no vision for your future. And two of those three options will get you nowhere. Some of you may have just a calculated bad vision of the future. I was talking to a young man this week and he said, well, I had to call my grandma on 4th of July. I said, what do you mean you had to call grandma? He said, I don't like to call grandma. I said, why don't you like to call your grandma? He says, she's the most negative person I know. So he calls her up and he says, hi grandma, how you doing? Of course her answer is, well, not well. Feel terrible. He says, well, sorry about that. He said, happy 4th of July. She said, it's not 4th of July, it's Independence Day. He said, I'm sorry grandma, happy Independence Day. She said, well, I'm not so happy. He said, well, Grandma, aren't you glad that you're free and you got independence? She said, well, I don't have it like I used to. This country's going to hell. Then he said, well, you know what, Grandma, I'm, I'm young. I just hope I always have independence the rest of my life. And she said, well, you probably won't. Goodbye. Now, how many people know that's probably not the vision for your future that you want to adopt? 
So every person, every person in this room, God wired your brain to see things in pictures. And the most miraculous thing is, is that you see pictures of your past when I say your first grade teacher, you see it. When I say grandma's house, you see it. When I talk about Christmas when you were a child, you see it. When I talk about your first car or when you got your license, you see it. When I talk about your wedding day, all of those things that have ever happened to you, the birth of your children, you see these pictures. Some of those memories stand out so that when I say, where were you when John F. Kennedy was assassinated? You can tell me exactly where you were, stands out to you. Or when the Challenger explosion had, where were you when 9-11 took place? How many people know the very place you were? You can see it with absolute clarity. But see, the beautiful thing is now God, as an element of faith, has given you the ability to do the same thing about your future. And your life today, where you're at today, is a, pic is, is a result of the pictures that you created or didn't create over the course of your life. Now, as I said, you, can, you have three choices. A bad picture, you can draw no picture, you can draw a good picture. Two of those three options are bad. Some people, like the grandma I was describing, they got a bad picture of the future. They just don't think about the future. They don't, they, 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 everything's negative about the future. You know, I, I, I'm probably going to get Alzheimer's like my parents did. I'm, I'm probably going to die of cancer sometime, just like dad did. You know what? I, 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 I'm always just going to have a, a hard time, uh, uh, you know, w financially. And I, I'll probably never really be able to get much ahead. That's just a negative picture. But here's the problem. When you draw, now listen to this very clearly. When you draw a picture for the future, you are displaying faith. And faith will move mountains. Some of those mountains are fun to move. Some of those mountains you want to keep. When I was in the Smoky Mountains, I'm glad nobody moved them. Some of those mountains are beautiful. But see, the it's not, about, it's not about just having faith for God to do great things or you to do great things. Your faith is powerful enough to do bad things. Do you know what fear is? Fear is faith in something bad happening. So everybody here that worries, everybody here that's got a problem being fearful and fretful and you worry about everything, the good news is you're a great person of faith. The bad news is you're putting faith in the wrong thing. You're drawing pictures of the future that are negative. You've got that ability. Some people don't draw negative pictures per se. They just draw no picture. They have no vision of their life in the future. I remember when I you know, first started preaching. I was 19 years old when I started doing this. And I look back on it, I'm thinking, why did anybody invite a 19-year-old person to come to their church and preach? But I had invitations all over the country. That may, that, may, that may be a testimony more of the shape of the churches than it was about me. And I can remember when I was 19 years old, I was a drummer. Nicky fell in love with a drummer. The bad news is he turned into a preacher. But I was a drummer. And, and I had a certain, you know, I had a certain persona. Because my vision was I wanted to be a drummer. That really was my vision for life. I wanted to be a musician. I wanted to be a drummer. So how many people know that that kind of directed the way that I talked, the way that I walked, the way I interacted with people, the way, the way I carried myself? And then I went through this process where I really believed that God then wanted me to be a minister, to be a teacher, to do what I'm doing now. And the first thing I had to do, someone says, what's the first thing that you want to do if you want to be a teacher, preacher? Well, it's not go to Bible college. It's not buy a suit. It's not to shine your shoes. It's not to get a nice haircut. It's not to marry a beautiful girl. The first thing you got to do if you want to be a preacher, listen to me, you got to see yourself as a preacher. You got to put a vision in front of you. You got to paint a picture just as clearly as grandma's house on Thanksgiving is to you or where you were when 9-11 happened. You've got to paint a picture that clear for your future. And you got to see yourself as that. I remember the first time, one of the first times I preached, I preached to probably about 1,500, 2,000 people in this huge camp meeting. And somebody said, were you nervous? I said, not at all. They said, how come you weren't nervous? I said, because I saw myself preaching there hundreds of times. It didn't catch me off guard. 
Having a vision is using your abilities that God has given you, invested in you, to think in pictures and applying it to your future and seeing yourself there. Some of you need to quit seeing yourself in bankruptcy, in a nursing home, or dying of some disease, and you've got to see yourself as successful. You've got to see your future, that you're going to be somebody. You're going to have a great marriage. You're going to have great kids. You're going to live in a beautiful place. You're going to be successful in your business. You're going to achieve great things. And when you start to formulate the vision for the future as clearly as your memory of the past, that's when faith will be activated and you will begin to become that person. Think about how God dealt with people in the Bible. It's interesting how he told them to look at themselves in the future and then begin to act that way. For instance, Abraham. Abraham was 100 years old with a 90-year-old wife with no children. And God says, get ready, you're going to have some kids. And how many people know that it took some faith for Abraham to see him and Sarah decorating the nursery? Pushing the baby carriage, right? Can you imagine seeing, <laughs> can you imagine seeing a 90-year-old woman you know, in the baby store? But they had to see it. They had to see themselves as parents in order for that to happen. The Bible talks about the faith of Abraham. God did the same thing with Moses. He spoke to him in pictures and said, I'm going to send you back and you're going to be a deliverer. Moses, as a shepherd in the wilderness, had to see himself as a deliverer. Do you know what David did to defeat Goliath? He had a vision of killing him. In fact, David stood before Goliath and he says, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to run out there. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take your ugly head from your shoulders and I'm going to feed your big old ugly body to the birds of the air and the beasts of the field. Now, how's that for a vision? How many people know that David saw himself cutting off the head of Goliath while it was still on Goliath's shoulders? Some of you got to start looking at your problems through the eyes of faith, which is vision. The first element of faith is vision. I got 12 elements. For the next 12 weeks, we're going to stay on this. But the first element you got to adopt is vision. David saw himself cutting off Goliath's head. David saw himself a victor, a champion before he ever was one. Jesus did the same thing with his disciples when he sent them out. He said, I'm going to send you out and you go to these cities and you go into these homes. He painted a picture for them. Even when he ascended unto heaven, he painted a picture for them. There's a story of a lady named Tara Holland who was Miss America in 1997. Tara Holland in 1995 lived in Florida and she went to the pageant to be Miss Florida but she finished as first runner-up. Well undetoured, she kept practicing and honing her skills. So in 1996 she knew she was going to win but she was again runner up at that point in time at that point in time she had a decision am I going to continue am I going to move forward am I going to stay with it or am I going to give up instead of giving up here's what she did she found every video that she could find in that day there wasn't a whole lot online but she found what she could video stores, wherever she could find. Every video she could find of every Miss America pageant, every Miss USA pageant, every Miss World, Miss Universe, Miss whoever, she found a pageant and she watched for one year, inundated herself, watched how those ladies carried themselves. And what she did was imagine herself becoming Miss America. And in 1997, she won the pageant. She was Miss Miss America. After she walked the runway and was handed the bouquet and the crown, she did a press conference. And the press asked her what was the secret for her to stay with it and her success. And she said this, I saw myself as Miss America. I saw myself. I had a vision. I could see it clearly. And I just began to walk towards that vision. 
you got to see yourself as successful, as somebody, as, as a person that can, can overcome alcoholism. you got to see yourself as a free person from pornography or drug addiction. you got to see yourself in a great marriage with a great family, being a great mom, a great dad, being successful in your business. Whatever vision that you've got in your heart, God says he'll give you the desires of your heart. He'll put them there. He wants you to work for that goal. And what she said is, I saw myself as Miss America when I saw myself, I just began to act like it. And then they asked her, were you nervous when you walked down the runway? And she said, as I said earlier, no, not at all. Because I saw myself walk down that runway thousands of times. God has given all of us the ability to have vision. Here's the second thing I want you to see. Is that you've got to beware of dream killers. You've got to beware of vision killers. There's people, there are things that, that, that will, will destroy your vision. One of them that's not on the list, I'm going to give you a list, just a, a short list. It's not exhaustive by any means. I just thought about this one. Do you know that culture can destroy a vision? We live in a culture, and the name of the part of our culture that is a, especially a dream killer is called the tall poppy syndrome. Has anybody ever heard of that term, the tall poppy syndrome? If you're from Australia, you know the tall poppy. We have a sister that grew up in Australia, and it was the Australians that really taught me about the tall poppy. And in, in Australian culture, they have what's called the tall poppy syndrome. Basically, when you're growing poppies, and I have no idea why anybody would want to grow poppies. I mean, they were in the Wizard of Oz, but if you know what that plant's used for, uh, whatever, I'm just saying, the tall poppy syndrome, when the poppies would grow, the tall ones get cut off. You don't want the tall ones. The tall ones get cut off. And there are particular cultures, and, and, and the Australians were, were, would be famous for this tall poppy syndrome when they talk about it, and it's this. If anybody gets too tall, we've got to cut them down. If anybody thinks that they're going to be more successful than me, we're going to cut them down. If anybody believes they're going to achieve too much, we're going to cut them down. And here's what happens in cultures like this. And I believe we share the same type of culture. When anyone succeeds, they become the object of criticism. I think that's the dumbest thing in the world. Because the fact is, when somebody achieves, it paves the way for others to come along. A man named Bannister did something that the scientists thought was humanly impossible. He ran, what was it, a four-minute mile? He broke the four-minute mile, and they thought that was humanly impossible. What's incredible, he's the first man on record to break the four-minute mile, but then the next year, 11 other athletes did it. It took someone who was successful to pave the way, and others then could walk that pavement. Don't ever criticize someone that's successful. Admire them. Because they are, believe it or not, keys for your success, keys for your vision. Cultures can be dream killers. People can be dream killers. You've got to be aware of dream killers. If you're going to do and take seriously what I'm telling you today, to be a person of faith, you see yourself as a champion, you see yourself as successful, see yourself as a winner, paint a clear vision of that, and you begin to live that way, I promise you, the devil's not going to make that easy on you. And there's going to be some dream killers. Sometimes it's a cultural thing, sometimes it's a family thing. I've seen families where if everybody's, you know, stone drunk about half the day, sitting on the couch in the front porch of the house, looking at four cars up on cement blocks in your front yard. I know, I just described your in-laws. You're jobless, living off the government, then you're one of us. But how dare you have the audacity to think you're going to go to school get a job, live in a nice home, drive a car that you didn't pull out of our front yard. How dare you believe that? You... I've seen families actually disenfranchise, marginalize, and be angry with the one child out of eight that went and did something. Tragic. The problem is that those people come to church and will we'll almost verify that negative sense of poverty in their mind. We'll spiritualize it. We'll call them humble. I'm sorry, that is not 
the biblical definition of humble. Poverty is not a blessing from God. If we're going to be followers of Jesus Christ, we got to see what Jesus did among his family. He achieved. I mean, I don't know anybody that achieved more than Jesus. And you know what happened in his life? His family came to get him because they said, we think he's insane. You remember that? Don't be surprised that there's dream killers. There are some dream killers. Let me, let me mention a few before we go on to that. There are some dream killers. Think about these. One dream killer is a sense of unworthiness. Sometimes we just have this overwhelming sense of unworthiness where we feel like, you know what, I'm really not worthy to, to achieve very much. I, I, I'm, just a, I'm just a lowly sinner and I've done so many wrong things. That's why God forgives you, ladies and gentlemen, so you can have a sense of worthiness. It's not worthy in who you are. Don't, it's worthy on who He is. I remember years ago, I always wanted to play at the... I lived in Washington Courthouse at that time. I always wanted to play golf on the country club. I drive by the country club there in Washington Courthouse, a beautiful place, and I always wanted to play in the country club. I couldn't afford it. You know, I, I, I we couldn't afford it, but I always thought, man, I'd like to play. So one day, there was a guy who was a business owner, and he, he told me, he said, well, you want to play in the country club? I said, I'd love to. He said, well, just go tell him you're going to play in my name. Now, we'll, we'll use his name as Bill, Bill Smith. <clears throat> and uh, I said, I, you don't need to be there? He says, no, you just go there. You walk in and you tell them you're playing on Bill Smith's behalf. So there I was. I was about 21 years old. I had me, you know, my Walmart special golf clubs. <laughs> I hate to tell you, but the balls I played with all had these beautiful little red stripes that went around them. Only a golfer knows what I'm talking about. And so I went, on, I went on the country club and I walked in. I was all nervous, you know, and all these guys drove up in their nice cars and there I was and you know, I drove in my 1975 Ford Maverick, three-speed on the column. And I walked in, and, and I hadn't paid the price. I was completely unworthy to walk through the door. But when I walked in the door, they said, your name, please? I said, I'm here on behalf of Bill Smith. And they said, oh, go right ahead. The first tee is free. From then on, I embarrassed myself for the next three hours. But I was on a country club. Because I paid the price? No, because he paid the price. Because I'm worthy? No, because he's worthy. And how many people know it would have been a slap in his face if I would have said to him what some of us say to God? Oh, no, I can't do that. I'm so unworthy. I'm so terrible. I, I don't have the right shoes. I don't drive the right... He would say, you know, I'm trying to do you a favor, son. Let me do you a favor. God is saying the same thing to you. Let me do you a favor. My son died to make you worthy. Would you start believing that? Unworthiness is a dream killer. Number two, other people's voice. Other people's voice. If you got a dream for your life and you got vision for your life and you want to see yourself as a champion, now listen to me. Everybody look this way. Here's what someone will say. Someone will say to me, oh, Pastor Mark, you know, so, some, somebody's going to dream that they're going to be the next Michael Jordan. And the problem is they're five foot six. And they got this dream and you're just feeding the dream and they're never going to get there. Listen to me very clearly. The value of dreams is not that you reach them. The value of a dream is it puts you in the right direction. Sometimes you're going to go towards the moon and you're not going to reach the moon, but you're going to be going in the right direction. And along the way, you're going to find many, many, many successes and you may or may not fulfill all your dreams. Frankly, I think if you fulfill all your dreams in your lifetime, you didn't dream enough dreams. They were too small. Keep on dreaming dreams, you old men. Come on, young men. See some visions like God said we would. See yourself in something greater and more than you are today. And don't quit dreaming. I don't care how old you are. Put yourself on a path towards that dream. But understand that in that path, there's going to be some dream killers. Other people's voice. Number three, unforgiveness. 
The horrible thing about having unforgiveness in your heart is when there's people like your parents or your uncle or your aunt or friends at school, if there's people that you have unforgiveness towards, here's what happens. It chains you to the pictures of the past. Come on, listen, listen. Forgiveness is not telling people what they did was okay. If somebody molested you, if someone stole from you, if someone took advantage of you, if someone, so someone uh, horribly abused you in verbal ways or physical ways, it's not okay what they did. But listen, when you forgive them, you're not saying what you did was okay. What you're doing is, is you are unchaining yourself from that picture. And you're freeing yourself up to draw a new picture. A picture, a vision of your future, of you being free, of you helping other people, of you having a great marriage, of you raising children that's not going to have to go through the crap that you went through all your life. Starting a whole new generation. Unforgiveness, however, will chain you to the past. Somebody once said unforgiveness is like drinking poison, helping the other, hoping the other person gets sick. Number four. The fourth dream killer I wanted to mention is making excuses. Fill that in your paper. Making excuses. Quit making excuses for yourself. Some of you are very good at that. Well, why can't you? Well, because, you know, I, I never... Well, why can't you? Well, because, you know, I, I'm not... Well, why can't you? Well, because my family never was... Well, why can't you? Because I'm a woman. I, and I'm a man, but I'm just saying... I'm saying No rumors. Why can't you? Because I'm black. Why can't you? Because I'm too old. Why can't you? Because I'm too young. Why can't you? I don't have enough money. Why can't you? Because I didn't go to college. I'm challenging you to put away the excuses. Quit making excuses for yourself that will constantly keep you way below the potential that God's put in you. I'm looking at people today that can change the world. It's an interesting thing when you study Appalachian culture. Some of the smartest people come out of Appalachian culture and they never do anything because they really don't believe they're smart. And I feel like part of the commission of the church is to challenge and change that mentality in our brains. Quit making excuses for yourself. My mom was 50 years old when she entered college. Graduated when she was 54. I've got pictures of me and my mom in caps and gowns. We graduated the same year from college, me and mom. There we were. We got pictures, me and mom together. She was 54 years old, started teaching, changed people's lives in the process of teaching second grade. What's your excuse? Whatever it is that's held you back, it may have been your excuse, that your favorite excuse you've held on for years. It's time to let it die. Caleb was 80 years old. When he said, I'm going to run the giants off my land and I'm going to make my home there in Hebron. He was 80 years old. What's your excuse? Put it away. Don't let that be a dream killer. Number, four, number five, yearning for sympathy. I threw that one in there, yearning for sympathy. I think it's a dream killer because there's people in this room that somewhere in your life you've mistaken love, you've mistaken sympathy for love. A dream killer is when you thrive on other people's pity. Like every time you have a limp, it's like... Oh. Every time you get sick, you got to put it on Facebook. What's up with that? Nobody cares. And all your Facebook friends, they ain't real friends. And when they say that they're really, you know, compassionate, it took them 13 seconds to key that in your comment box. We need to have a class on Facebook etiquette. <laughs> it is not the place when you have an argument with somebody. Hello, I'll quit meddling. I'll just back up. Yearning for sympathy will always put you as a beggar at other people's mercy. You will always have a vision or, 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 a, or a place in life where you are lesser than people and you're looking for a handout. In this sense, it may or may not be money, but at least it's someone's sympathy. Pity is not love. Come on, stand up on your feet. You don't need anybody's sympathy. Ain't nobody cares. 
Oh, Pastor Mark, you made me feel bad. I thought, I thought you cared. Now, just for today, let me say it this way. I don't care. Just for today, let's, let's pretend this. I don't care. Get on your feet, son. Come on. You got things going for you. You're a child of God. You've got abilities. You've got gifts. God has sown things into you that you've never, ever capitalized on. And nobody will feel sorry for you. Get up. There's a man right there that lost a leg a few weeks ago. He's not feeling sorry for himself. Why should anybody else? You got to stand up. You got to move forward. And until you adopt that attitude, and you may think, Pastor Mark, you're just being a little rough on me today. I just don't feel good. Okay, just for today. Sometimes you need someone to give you sympathy. Other times you just need a drill sergeant. You need someone to look you in the eye and say, get on your feet. Son, what's wrong? You big baby, go. Get to work. Get out of bed. Sometimes, and a lot of times we need that. I'm telling you, Jesus, Jesus, we, we, we mix Jesus up with Mr. Rogers. Don't confuse him with Mr. Rogers. Not Jesus, he's a carpenter. You ever been around builders? You ever been around construction people? How many people work construction sometime in your life? Ooh. Tim, <laughs> construction people? I mean, it's not an easy world. No, Jesus was a construction guy. Jesus was a guy that made a whip and beat people up when they were in the temple misbehaving. This is a guy that says in the Bible, when he comes back, fire is going to come out of his mouth and a sword is going to destroy people. You ever read that part? Where he sits on, he's got a tattoo on his leg. I mean, seriously, it says that about Jesus in heaven. He's got a tattoo on his leg. It says, King of kings and Lord of lords. He's tatted up on a horse with a sword coming back. to. And the Jesus we're selling to people is the little, little guy that's like, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to invite him to my house. I wouldn't want him around my boys. He's too soft. I'm telling you the truth today. Number six, conformity. Number six, the sixth dream killer I wanted to mention is conformity. That means that we conform to the culture. And you need to understand we live in a culture of poverty, a culture, a, a culture that, that, that is less than what it ought to be. We live in a culture that doesn't promote abundance and success. It really is more comfortable with being ordinary and being a nobody. That's our culture. And you've got to fight. You've got to fight to resist being conformed by that cultural opinion. I've got to finish. Number three. Are you okay today? Your ability for vision every person has in this room. You think in pictures. you just got to start thinking some pictures of your future of good things. You got to beware of dream killers. Number three, you've got to embrace dream makers. You got to embrace dream makers. Now, here, here are just three things I'm going to conclude with. Number one, you got to improve your vision. Number two, you've got to enlarge your vision. And number three, you got to protect your vision. I want you to write those down and, and think about that for just a minute. You've got to in, improve your vision enlarge your vision. I'm challenging you today to improve your vision, enlarge your vision, and protect your vision. What is it that you want to do? What is it that you see yourself doing? What, what, what next great thing can you see yourself out there? Get a clear picture of that. When you see that picture, number one, you need to improve that picture. Think about a caterpillar. Would anybody believe if a caterpillar just got... I mean, caterpillars are kind of gross and disgusting looking creatures. I mean, maybe you're a caterpillar lover. God bless you. I don't know what that says about you. But honestly, big, fat, round things that just kind of, they don't even walk. They just kind of, you know, like Jabba the Hutt. They just kind of roll in. Would you ever believe if a big old slimy, nasty caterpillar rolled right in this room about the size of a piano and he looked up at you with these droopy eyes and slobbering mouth and he would say to you, I can fly. I've got wings inside of me. Do you think if the caterpillar ever looked in the mirror that he would say, wow, That guy's got flight inside of him. 
There's nothing about a caterpillar that would ever, ever convince anyone that one day they're going to sprout wings and be this beautiful, flying, majestic, wonderful, light, and free butterfly. There's nothing in a caterpillar that would testify of that. What you've got to do is stop looking in the mirror and confessing your caterpillarism, your caterpillarity. You've got to look in the mirror, and no matter what you see looking back, you've got to say, that guy's got flight in him. David looked in the mirror one day and said this, I am wonderfully made. Great is the work of your hands. You've got to be able to look in the mirror, and if you see a caterpillar looking back, you've got to see a butterfly. You've got to paint a vision that improves who you are. Go back to school. Read a few books. Go to some seminars. Try something new. You say, well, where do I start? Some of you need to start with your dishes. Huh? Get a vision of a clean kitchen. It's raining outside. Y'all are just so depressed. You can't... Huh? Some of you need to start with your, with, with your, with, with your sock drawer. You need to get a vision of a straightened out sock drawer. Some of you need to go in your living room and see a vision of a clean place. You need to go in that garage and believe it or not, see a vision that cars one day could be in that garage. You got to get a vision of a landscape. You know what I found if you start small and have a few small victories, you can get to the bigger victories. It starts at home. Look in the mirror and start seeing you less 30 pounds. Look in the mirror and start saying, beneath that belly fat, there's a six pack somewhere. You, start looking at yourself, look at your situation with vision of improving it. Number two, enlarge it. Enlarge it. We've got to realize that we're serving God. And when you figure in the God factor, you, you got to figure out all things of the natural and you got to figure in supernatural and that's a fun thing to do. I heard one time of a golf pro that visited a king in Saudi Arabia. And the king wanted this particular golf pro to come over and you know, teach him how to play golf. So he spent a couple of weeks there with the king teaching him how to play golf. He was getting ready to get back on his, his leased air, uh, Lear jet to fly home to America. And the king said, what do you want me to give you? He said, no, no, you've already done enough already. He had paid him to come over and do that. He said, you've done enough already. The king says, no, no, no. I want to give you a special gift. What do you want? And the guy thought, and he thought, well... He said, I collect golf clubs. So why don't you just get me a golf club? That'd be nice. So he got on board the plane. He flew back to America. And the next two or three weeks went by. And, he, you know, nothing came. But he said, well, you know, maybe he's making a special gold putter. Or he's, he's you know, a special driver with diamonds in it or something. And about a, a month or two later, he gets an envelope in the mail. And it is from the king of Saudi Arabia. And he says, what is this? And he opens up the envelope and inside was a deed to a 500 acre golf club huh so when we say golf club and a king says a golf club they're two different things you 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 gotta you gotta put faith in your god that God thinks bigger of you than you think of yourself. He thinks better of you than you think of yourself. He sees better things for you than if you've ever thought of yourself. If you get linked in with him, be prepared for the ride. He's going to take you on a ride that can lead to greater and greater things. Enlarge your vision. Improve your vision. Enlarge your vision. Protect it. Protect your vision. Think about Joseph in the Old Testament. Man, he had a vision that, you know, he, the only mistake he made is he told his brothers. He said, I had this dream and, you know, I'm like exalted, lifted up and I'm going to be in this power position. And I saw you guys, you're like my subordinates and you're like bowing down to me. Wow, isn't that cool? Tall poppy. And as Joseph's brothers take him and throw him in a pit and throw him into slavery and sell him off into Egypt and lo and behold, guess what happens? God uses all of it. Are you still with me today? God uses all of it to bring Joseph to a place of second in command, just below Pharaoh of all of Egypt. 
And I say that to tell some of you, it doesn't matter what your mom and dad did and what your brothers did and what the family does. It doesn't matter what the neighbors do and it doesn't matter what those kids did to you in fifth grade. It does not matter. You get you a vision and let God help birth that vision clearly in your mind and watch what will happen. God, despite what anybody else does, is going to help you achieve that vision. I want you to stand up and I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to start right now seeing a vision that is improved, improved upon. It is enlarged. And I want you to I want you to capture that picture in your mind. Go ahead, try it. Close your eyes. <clears throat> See yourself wearing wearing thinner clothes. See yourself walking across the stage at a high state university getting your diploma, your master's degree. See yourself. See your name on a placard that says Dr. So-and-so. Your name on it. See it. See a sign for your business. You've always wanted to be a mechanic. You've always wanted to see that sign. See that business. You're owning it. See that. Paint a picture. See yourself in front of the camera. See yourself on the stage. See yourself with, with wonderful children. See yourself in a perfect marriage. See yourself in a, in a situation that you've always desired in your heart, but you were afraid to let yourself see it. See it today. I want to give you permission to dream dreams and see visions, just like God said we would. I want to prepare you for the fight. I want to prepare you that it's not going to be easy. I want to prepare you. You're going to have to battle your way to that. I want to prepare you that you're going to have to work. I want to prepare you that others are going to try to steal that vision. I want to prepare you it's not going to happen probably today or tomorrow. But with that vision is going to come a strength, an internal fortitude that will rise up in you that you're going to see that vision completed. And I want to prepare you for this. You may see that vision, and when you get there, it may or may not be exactly like you pictured it. But I want to reiterate that at least going for that vision is going to put you on the right path. It'll put you in the right trajectory. It's going to head you in the right direction. Don't stop dreaming dreams and seeing visions. God bless this house. Bless the people that are here today. I pray, God, that you will renew some of us who have had dreams and let them die, visions and let them die. God, I got a vision for every seat in this place filled. I got a vision for a larger, a larger tent. I got a vision for a greater, a, a greater cause. I got a vision for, for a city that, 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 is, that is radically changed for the better. Lord, I got a vision for Southern Ohio and this, this, this culture because of the people in this room begins to shift and change where we're raising up a generation of people who believe that they can achieve great things. I believe that coming out of these hills are people who will find, who will find cures to diseases, people who will, find, who, will, who will find ways to do things that will revolutionize entire industries, disruptive technologies from brilliant inventions for teachers and doctors and lawyers and moms and dads world changers Lord God I pray that as we birth this vision together and as we fight together to fulfill these visions that in all things we would have to back up and say our strength comes from our God and we give you honor we give you glory God we give you credit we will never take it because our strength and our vision comes from you, God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Praise God. Everybody, just clap your hands one more time.